Howdy folks, Jambariki here, and welcome to another episode of Film Chums. Joining me is my co-host, Viva Becca. Tear my life into pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of, well, a few uh, controversial films that shocked audiences. So, Viva, um, what kind of movie usually would, like, um, shock you? Like, when do you think, like, a film goes too far? I think uh, the film goes too far if it starts uh, causing significant harm. I mean, it's you have to weigh the good that the movie puts out versus the bad. And uh, if it's much more negative, then maybe we need to question if the movie should exist at that point. I could think of maybe if it was a propaganda piece or something... That was very influential and was encouraging negative people to take negative actions against others. I mean, I've I've seen Nazi propaganda films and I've seen clips of North Pro uh, North Korean propaganda films and like yeah, mm -hmm. those should definitely those are there are those are offensive. Those should be like kept away, um, archived mm -hmm. only for like um, historical context. That's it. <laughs> For me, I've very rarely seen a film that's genuinely shocked me because I grew up watching exploitation movies as a teenager. Uh, when I was young, I actively seeked out controversial films to see what all the fuss was about. I also come from a country that has a history of banning films willy-nilly, so I tried to be rational about which movies actually deserve to be pulled. But as I've gotten older, I've become a lot more conscious of how cinema can affect the public's mindset and how filmmaking can be dangerous in the wrong hands. At the same time, a movie's behind-the-scenes abuse can be deeply disturbing and uh, make a film hard to watch. Heck, I've sometimes refused to watch a movie because of how the actors were treated. Okay, so the first film we're going to talk about is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When Sally, her brother Franklin, and their friends go on a road trip to stay in an abandoned house together, they all end up becoming victims of the cannibalistic Sawyer family. So, Viva, what did you think of this film? Um, I thought it was kind of boring. And I really? feel like <clears throat> it might be a little unfair because it's one of those movies... Uh, from my understanding, that started a lot of trends. So it would have been mm. more groundbreaking if you saw it earlier. But having grown up with those trends, I wasn't really... So, like, I didn't see anything new. Mm. I wasn't surprised by anything. I get I get where you're coming from, because it, it's, a bit, it's a bit like going to watch um, High Noon after watching um, uh, The Good, The Bad, and Ugly. <laughs> it's like... Because uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a lot of its impact has come from being the first of many things. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's where that's its importance. Like it's the first time we had a final girl, and all, all the principles or the techniques of like slasher horror is here. This is like basically it's it, it, it takes what Psycho had done, and just like uh, like elevates it a bit more, and kind of like starts to represent a lot of the horror films that we see today. Mm -hmm. Like it, I feel like nearly every every slasher film that comes out today, most of them. Most of the ones that really want to prove how edgy they are, they use they use Texas Chainsaw, the original Texas Chainsaw, as their blueprint. The violence level thing probably was a lot more shocking back in the 70s when it came out as well. Because uh, I was reading a little bit about why it was controversial, because I wasn't sure, and they're like, oh, the most scary, horrifying, the most violent movie of all time. And I'm like, really? Not anymore, that's for sure. Yeah, that's what's kind of interesting about it, is because to save money... There's not much blood, yeah, and a lot of a lot of it's off screen, and um, people have praised that because it, it leaves the audience to imagine what uh, what the, what the violence looks like, and that can sometimes be worse than what a filmmaker can actually show. Have you seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? The new, well, I don't remember the name. The one from 2013. I've not seen any others. The only sequel, and I've only, I've only seen clips of it, is the one with Renny Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey. Oh, okay. That's the, that's the only one I've seen. Interesting. I haven't seen that one, but I did see the one... Uh, I, I've seen another one of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, and uh, the story setup and the arrangement of scenes is virtually identical, um, down to, like, all right, they're going to van part here and then two first two go off here and then house scene running through the woods all that kind of thing um it was almost exactly the same 
So that was another thing that kind of made it a bit predictable for me. And I feel like that might not be fair because I had seen the other movie, which was obviously supposed to be this movie, the original, except for improved and updated. But there just weren't any surprises. And uh, it wasn't that scary because it was old school, so they didn't really show anything. No, I, I, get, I get from a modern perspective the problems that people would have with this film. For me, though, I appreciate it mainly on a technical level mm -hmm. because because of what it's trying to do. And while while there is a lot of horror films nowadays trying to copy it, they don't get what the original was trying to do. Because like the the reason why audiences found the original scary was because it had that documentary feel mm. to like the, uh, the the filmmaking, like very handheld kind of like thing that made you feel like you were really there. And everything, every, and everything was insanely <laughs> cheap, and it worked to the film's advantage. Yeah, like th those were real locations. They didn't build those sets. They literally went to abandoned places to like real slaughterhouses, those kinds of things. Like everything looks very authentic because of that. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of horror films nowadays that are like try to replicate, and it's like you, you don't get, you can't really replicate what they were trying to what they were trying to go for. Yeah, and now I feel like uh, audiences are probably desensitized to the whole documentary style handheld thing. Now that every single action scene looks like it's been shot on maracas. But like when when you look back at the time, it was yeah. like in, it, it was so refreshing because like there was nothing else like it. There was literally nothing. Nothing else was trying to be this daring. A every other horror film that was coming out, there were there were like people in monster suits or um, charming people that turned out to be serial killers, that kind of thing. But this film was just like, screw it, we're just going to go crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I, def I definitely get what the film was going for and I feel like it does an okay job at it. I really like the atmosphere of the film. That's that's my biggest takeaway from the whole movie is I really like, I really like how we stay so long in a lot of like places and get mm -hmm. get, a li get like kind of like a strong feeling of what this the, the emptiness of this town and like the sense of danger that was happening in this uh, for the the characters, I don't know, just just the feel. Yeah. I just like the feel of what what's going on. Uh, but at the same time, I will admit it does turn things up to eleven a lot. <laughs> Did you feel like you were worried about the characters? Oh no, no, no. I, that's <laughs> I would say my big, my biggest criticism against this film, and I'm not sure if others have made it, but like I didn't care about any of the characters it, the, even the character that actually had a personality is the worst character yeah which one was that which one frank franklin oh the the one that wouldn't, wouldn't stop whining about everything the, the guy that they thought was real funny yeah sally sally, sally. <laughs> you just look like you look like his sister was gonna go shut up <laughs> <laughs> Any second, I was like, I'm looking forward to when you get killed, me. Honestly, me <laughs> yeah, too. I and I was, and I was so disappointed they didn't show anything. He just like flaps around in his chair for a little bit. I'm like, man. <laughs> <laughs> he has the, that thing where he like to do raspberries like one after the other and keep doing them. But then another character started doing that later. So I'm like, maybe this is just a directorial decision. And mm. um, like raspberries are one of my pet peeves because I can just feel the sound like rippling through my body and it's very uncomfortable it's like mm. nails on a chalkboard to me and just for that i would say don't watch the movie because you're gonna have a bad time because <laughs> it's 80 percent screaming and 20 percent raspberries <laughs> but all the other characters they're just like eh. even the final girl is like eh. it's like there's nothing there's really nothing all to their characters they're pretty much just props mm -hmm. For, for the uh, for the for the story, but I guess maybe that's the point. The film is mainly about dehumanizing uh, humans to being like um, cattle to slaughter. So maybe that's the point. Man. Yeah, it goes along with the theme, and the characters are kind of just there to let you live in the aesthetic and the atmosphere that they've created. And it was a unique atmosphere at some point, but nowadays probably it won't be that it won't impact you that much because there's so many people doing that. But I felt like this one did it the best. Out of all the ones I've seen try to do, I felt like this is the one that came closest. But I feel like it's mainly because of the limitations they had to work with. And this goes without saying, but the, the villains are the most entertaining part. <laughs> they they seem to have, like completely know what uh, what they're meant to be doing, what, what roles they're in for, what they're supposed to be pulling off, what the tone of the film is. They're just going absolutely nuts with it. Yeah. What was the name of the... Um... The first guy they met, like the one brother that they meet at the beginning, the hitchhiking brother. I can't brother. remember his name. Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember his name. I feel like they left the actor a little bit too clean and like 
I guess, not gross looking. He looked kind of like mm. a normal dude, and they put like a little red on him. He, do, he just looked like a, a, an average person from the 70s, I'll be yeah, honest. Yeah, I'm like, why are his teeth so good? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he looks the most normal out of the family. Leatherface is just iconic. Like the, the the whole image of Leatherface is just like left such a massive impact on horror cinema. Honestly, the part at the end when he's like on the road and he's just dancing around, that was hilarious. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? Kind of, <laughs> it's kind of intentional. So basically with that scene, um Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface, who was just so sick of production, was just he, he was allowed to improvise that scene. And he used that scene to, like, take out his anger on the director. <laughs> that was him basically pretending to kill the director. What a graceful killing, <laughs> yeah, though. I, but yeah, the, the, the Leatherface character is, is, like... It takes the whole Ed Gein, uh, like, um, story, which is... I don't know if you know but like, he was a serial killer. Like, after he killed them, he would turn his victims into furniture mm -hmm. and wear their skin as masks. Yeah. So it kind of takes that and also puts it on Gunnar, Gunnar Hansen, who was, like, a massive guy. To, like make it even more intimidating and i think i feel like the reason why leatherface stands out a bit more compared to like other slasher characters because most slasher characters they're they're, they're they're very silent they're very silent kind of characters but with this one there's, some, there's something a bit infantile about him if you know what i mean He's, he seems he, he seems to be like both scared and angry at the same time it's, it's kind of like because he's meant to be like have a childlike brain mm -hmm. that's i think that's the the intention yeah it just, it just stands out a bit more compared to, like, your Jason and your Michael Myers. Yeah, it's, uh, he's definitely a different kind of character, because he messes up. He's, like, useless, and he's so slow. So mm, mm. it sets him apart he's from the other guys that are, like, forces of nature, kind of, like, laughing and stuff. Yeah. He's got a lot of character to him. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's a much more feminine kind of slasher killer as well. And, like, even towards the end, he tries to take on this matriarchal role within the, within the killer family. Okay, so in terms of controversy, mm -hmm. the, the, film was, the film caused controversy so much so that um, it got banned in quite a few countries, including my own. What I, what I gathered was the main, the main reason why people were, like, offended and shocked by it was because of the frenzy of it all. They couldn't really pinpoint a scene that was, like, particularly grotesque. They just thought, like, the whole experience was just too much. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they all narrowed it down to. How did you watch the movie if it's banned in England? It got unbanned, like, in, like, 2000, I think. Uh -huh. But But for, for me, the, the only thing that I find offensive is the, the way that the actors were treated honestly absolutely abysmal and it's kind of it's kind of annoying how toby hooper is all often put on, put on a pedestal because he was terrible to his actors in this film not only did he really underpay them mm -hmm. but like he just treated them like garbage and everyone had a horrible time on the film the the scene that was the hardest for the actors to shoot was uh the actual dinner scene because on the table they had like a chicken carcass mm -hmm. And they also had all these other dead animals in the room for decoration. Mm -hmm. And they also had to keep they had to keep the windows closed. And it was like Texan summer. <laughs> so there was a horrible smell going off. And there was there was apparently burning some there were burning some dead animals in the in the garden or something that made the smell even worse. So the actors had to deal with that. And at one point, Sally's actress, you know when she's like gagged? That that thing they gagged with her, it's not it's not a prop. It's literally just something they found in the abandoned house they they were they were filming in. Uh, yeah, pretty gross. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that we have various ideas in the arts about like the gifted like the gifted artist, like the one mastermind artist that you just have mm. to listen to them and whatever they do is going to be great because they're magic or something. Because that's not true, and no. even if it was true, that doesn't mean that you should let some crazy guy, like, be making hostile working conditions for everybody. Exactly, yeah, the actors agreed to be in this film, but they did not agree to be abused. Yeah. And, like, I, I find it really annoying when people make the defense, like, oh, but it looks great on camera. Yeah, it does, but the, the actors were still traumatized. Can you imagine how much better it would look on camera if the actors could focus on doing a good performance instead of, like, exactly. trying not to yeah. die? Yeah, it's very insulting to the actors to say, like, you know what, you're not good enough at your job, so we'll have to, like, make you go for the actual trauma to make it authentic. Yeah, like, if you didn't think they were good enough of an actor, why did you hire them? Yeah. 
Are you ready to talk about natural born killers? Yep. Mallory Knox is living with an abusive father and a neglectful mother. She ends up falling in love with a meat delivery man called Mickey. Mickey helps Mallory kill her parents, and the two lovers go on the run. They're eventually caught by a corrupt detective called Jack Skekinetti, then are both sent to a nightmarish prison run by a demented warden. One day, Mickey agrees to be interviewed by sleazy Australian crime journalist Wayne Gale live on TV. Mickey's dramatic speech on television riles up the prisoners, and a brawl ensues. Mickey and Mallory use this opportunity to break out, all while Wayne documents their big escape. So what did you think of this film? It was really weird to see RDJ with a different accent. <laughs> that was the big thing I took away from it. Only love can kill a demon. Hold that thought. Wasn't too weird for me for Robert Downey Jr. doing an accent because I've, I've seen him do British when he was in Chaplin. How do you do, sir? I'm Charlie Chaplin. Chapman sent me a telegram. Oh, and I wanted to know how much Tarantino had to do with it, because it, it felt like one of his movies, and I know he was just a writer, but it felt like his stuff. In terms of Tarantino's involvement, it's based on a script he wrote, and Tarantino hated the film. He was very public about how much he, he didn't like the film, he didn't like how it, how it turned out. Well, that's ridiculous, because it feels like the kind of thing that he would do. It, it really reminded me of, like, From Dust Till Dawn. That one's also about a pair of, like, killers on the run, and Tarantino wrote that. We gotta get our ashes into Mexico tonight, and then Carlos is gonna meet us there at the rendezvous tomorrow morning. Okay, the best way for me to describe this film would be, it's like watching a crime documentary after taking LSD. Would you agree? Um, I don't know, I haven't had LSD <laughs> before, so I'm not sure, but it was, it was pretty fun. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend you watching mm. it if you were on, like, anything, because it's, it would be hard for you to follow. It's already kind of got those whatever, like, influenced filters over it, so you don't need to be wine drunk, you don't need to be on anything. Um, you should probably be able to focus on it, because if you can't, and you're trying to do something else, you're probably not going to follow the movie as well. It's quite crazy, but the filmmaking style, as far as I know, is very typical of Oliver Stone. Because I've seen clips of his other stuff, and he really likes to kind of, like, have very quick cut mm -hmm. camera going all over the place, kind of like... Uh, and like switching between color and black and white, that kind of stuff. So it's it's, I feel like it's 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 got his touch. <laughs> so like I, that's why I didn't I didn't get too mad at that because I was like, oh well, it's just Oliver Stone, <laughs> just being Oliver Stone. <laughs> you know what? I feel like even with all the the effects on it, it was followable. So I don't get too mad. I didn't get too mad about it. I mean, you could still follow what he was trying to say. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's very entertaining mainly because. It doesn't take itself too seriously, and it's batshit insane, and the actors are kind of hamming it up a bit as well. Yeah, I <laughs> so think like, yeah, you would it, you would watch it for the style of the movie. I don't think you would very watch it for the story of the movie because the story of the movie, if you strip it down to actually what they're saying, it's kind of boring. It, it's just the Bonnie and Clyde story, really. When you when you kind of slightly boil it, it's it's just that formula. And like when when you look at both serial killer characters. They're not that fascinating. Yeah, they're not. They're just generic serial killer characters loosely based on real serial killers. Now! Oh. There is no escape in here! Who's the lucky one? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a redneck by its toe. But I, I, I will say that the film did a decent job when it come to, came to like how trauma can affect serial killers. How, how, it, how it stops them from doing their kill sometimes, because they have like a flash. Particularly if it was like a childhood abuse. Like that was quite, that was quite close to what real serial killers are like. I would say a lot a lot of the film's personality comes down to the actual actors. Yeah. And they, they did a really good choice for the actors. Like, the, Woody Harris, I love Woody Harrelson and other stuff, and I love Juliette Lewis and other stuff, and I feel like if, you, if you're going to have some, like, crazy uh, serial killers where the actors have to, like, fill in the holes, fill in the details, and add the, add the charisma, I feel like they're a great choice. Let's go out there and run down the stairs and go out in a hail of bullets. And then we'll die. And then we'll really be free. That's poetry. But we'll do that when all else fails. 
I've seen, it's kind of hard to explain, but you've seen characters that are basically them before, where it's like, here, you're going to play this mm. person who shoots other people, and they're crazy, but there's something about them. Um, and I've seen a lot of actors try and do that, actors that are good at doing other things, but they don't really pull it off. Maybe it seems like they're trying on purpose to act too crazy or they're acting crazy, but they don't manage to pull off that charisma of like, they're crazy, but they have that thing, um, which is really mm -hmm. hard. But I think they both did a really good job of doing that in this movie. Yeah, they, they, I think all I think all the actors really carried, carried the film because mainly because they knew what film they were in. Yeah. I don't think anyone was clueless what, what, uh, what Oliver Stone wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is on the same acting range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can't imagine um, that you could read the script for this movie and not know what film it's going to be with all of the yeah, cuts exactly. and being like, okay, so we're going to zoom in and to do this slideshow and then reading that 70% of the shots are going to be Dutch angles. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't too sure about the actual message because like the whole, the whole idea of the film, mm -hmm. as far as I know, is that it's meant to explore the cycle of violence how uh, serial killers are inspired by the media, they go out to kill, and then the media exploits that. So it's like a cycle, it's like a cycle. That's what the point was, as well as like how childhood trauma can um, end up creating serial killers and how uh, serial killers will look back on those traumas uh, with like roast into glasses. I get that, but the execution is where I'm kind of like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Like, it, it's hard to miss the message, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, the execution could be a little bit better. Yeah, the subtlety is not the strong point of the film. I mean, like, we, we, we get to a scene where it's literally just text over the characters, like, he's a demon. <laughs> Do you get it, audience? He's a demon. <laughs> yeah, they should have, I feel like they should have taken that out, because that whole scene, one, it felt kind of awkward and racist, and, mm -hmm. um... Two, I don't know exactly what they were driving at, but it seemed like the point of the scene was contradicting the point that they were trying to make with the movie mm, a little bit. Because yeah. they're like, oh, he's a rattlesnake. He's just, he's just, he's always like that. But then with the movie, they were trying to make the point that he wasn't. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's almost like I, I like, I like what the film could have been more than what it is. I think that's what I want to drive home is that like, there, there was potential. There was definitely potential there, and it brings up some questions and points that I find interesting. But in this film's hands, it's, it's kind of less interesting. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. Like I agree with that for sure. But it's 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 entertaining in how mad it is, particularly by the end when we have like a massive prison brawl while Robert Downey Jr. is trying to like document these serial killers escaping. It's it's nuts. <laughs> and then you got Tommy Lee Jones going, Oh what what's going on? <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. it's like it's a bonkers. it's very entertaining. It's a good time. Mm. The good time of the style really sort of covers up everything. Let's see, I liked the parts where they would show the scene and transition really smoothly in between what the serial killers are doing and then the uh, news or documentary broadcast or whatever about it. So it seemed like mm. everything you were watching was within a documentary broadcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After that, there was just no stopping Mickey and Mallory. They tore up the countryside with their vengeance right out of the Bible. The interview scene is very compelling. Yeah. Uh, and it is down again. It's very much down to the actors. It's the most relaxed part in terms of the mm, the weird mm. cutting, so you have a chance to actually watch the actors' performances without being distracted for a mm. bit. I mean, they shine weird lights on them, but you can watch the performances. So that's your bit to really calm down and like mm. feel the the performance, which is nice. Mm, and you really get you get the sense of both characters in that moment. Yeah, you, you do. Really do. Who's innocent, Wayne? You innocent? I'm innocent. Yes, I am. Of murder, definitely. It's just murder, man. All God's creatures do it. Okay, in terms of controversy, this film mainly caused controversy because uh, there are a lot of copycat crimes, particularly with the Columbine massacre. In in the uh, in the shooter's diary, they actually codenamed 
uh, their uh, their murders as MBK, Natural Born Killers. Yeah, how do you feel about that? I feel like that's not completely fair. Yeah, yeah, it's not entirely fair, because this is a movie that actively condemns turning serial killers into celebrities. That's the whole point of the film. But at the same time, there was always going to be a big risk when making a movie about serial killer protagonists played by charismatic Hollywood stars, especially when said characters never actually face any consequences by the end. I really don't think that the filmmakers wanted to inspire copycat murders, that's very far-fetched, but I can see why Mickey and Mallory struck a chord with the wrong kinds of people. Yeah, I don't know if I want to say it's completely one one side or the other. Uh, like, if you're going to go out and do something wild and crazy, then that's on you. But at the same time, I do believe mm. in the power of media to at least influence the way that people think about concepts or what they expect about various concepts in the world, especially if it's something that they haven't experienced, especially when it's patterns of media that they, that you grow up on. I do think that has an impact on you. Oh, I, I, will, I will agree. There's, there, there's a lot of media that definitely needs to take responsibility um, for kind of like riling up those kinds of people. But I feel like people blame the, blame the wrong media. They, they tend to go for media that, like, they personally find offensive. Yeah. And instead of thinking, okay, it's not... What about the bigger picture here? And I think that they um, break up the blame into too few pieces. It's either it's, like, a load of blame pushed onto one area or another area, but it's quite a complicated mix of factors. Like, for instance, you know, mm. if... Why would somebody be depending so much on whatever media it is you're talking about to shape their worldview then? Like, if that's true, why? Because I would argue that the average person who's well-supported and has a social structure might turn there first instead of trying to get all of their views and ideas and things from the media. It's, it's very... Exactly. It's, it's really complicated. Super complicated. Like, you can't be boiled down to one thing. Yeah. And, but it, that's that's how a lot of reactionaries respond, though, because, like, they want a quick answer. And the easiest answer is, like, oh, it's the new horror film that came out or something like that. So I, I guess, like, the my conclusion on it would be then it's, it's not... I would lean towards it's probably not your fault if you've made a movie about it. But that doesn't mean that if you're going to make a movie about crazy stuff, you shouldn't put in an effort to portray it in a way that will not be harmful to people. As, as over-the-top as the film is... It does deconstruct the whole serial killer celebrity thing at the same time by showing, like, look, they're not really that in love. Look, they are actually not that strong and badass. They're, they're v deeply traumatized. So, like, they do kind of break it down a bit, but at the same time, it's it's just it's just one of the problems with satire. Yeah. Whenever you do satire, you can you get you can find that kind of like line of like, okay, you got you got you got to satirize this thing, but not become that thing. It's really really difficult. Yeah. Uh, I would say maybe watch it if you want to see some style. Uh, if you want to actually just experience the story, you might just want to watch the interview part, like a clip of that. If you're really touchy about racist stuff towards Native Americans, don't watch the movie. It's just a very crazy, acid-trippy serial killer movie with some very good actors having fun mugging at the camera. Yeah. There you go. If you want that, there you go. <laughs> Last of all, we're going to be talking about A Clockwork Orange. Alex is a criminal teenager who leads a gang of drugs on nightly violent attacks. When the drugs grow tired of Alex's leadership, they convince him to break into a rich lady's house, and Alex ends up murdering the woman. The police arrive and Alex's drugs bail on him. Alex is locked up in prison, where he befriends a priest, who tells Alex about a controversial science experiment being performed on prisoners. Alex convinces the minister to let him become a guinea pig for the scientists. In the experiment, Alex is brutally tortured and brainwashed into hating violence to the point where it makes him feel sick. He's then returned into society, but his parents refuse to let him back home, and all of his former victims try to punish him in revenge. One victim goes as far as to push Alex to jump out of a window and injure himself. This sparks outrage from the media, and the minister has to apologise to Alex for all the trauma. Okay, so Viva, have you seen Clock or Orange before? Yes. And what do you think of it? I think it's okay. I haven't read the book. I can't judge it based on its faithfulness to the book. Uh, I like how much work they put into making it seem like the future, making it feel like society has progressed to a different place. It's kind of hard for me to tell if something is supposed to be weird because it's in the future or if that's just a British thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
What I like about the future in this film is that it looks like Britain would be in like f a few years from now, probably. <laughs> Because like there are there are there's so many films that like portray like the 2020 as is like this um, amazing place with fully fl flying cars and everything's perfect mm -hmm. and uh, uh, all the fashions dramatically changed all the aesthetics dramatically changed it's like nah I don't <laughs> everyone's just gonna be nostalgic for the 70s or by this point and uh, not much will be better <laughs> so that's what I like about the future it's either amazing or it's destroyed and it's good in this one that's like a mixture between mm. futuristic but also just like gross and destroyed so it's, it's a unique kind of future i really like it and the main reason it, it looks like that as well is because kubrick wanted a low budget so he could do that <laughs> he wanted a low budget or he got a low budget yes he want he wanted yeah he sorry he wanted a low budget he could ask for more because at, at this time kubrick was like Warner Brothers little prize machine. <laughs> so like he could ask whatever he wanted. He was like, no, I don't. I just want this much because this this is the kind of future I want to portray. Mm. Interesting. I have a hard time saying anything positive about Kubrick because I hear he's kind of an asshole. So we will get to that. We will <laughs> definitely get to that. It's it's a little tricky for me to be unbiased about any Kubrick film because for a lot of for a lot of filmmakers like myself, he's one of the masters. He's one of the people you're meant to kind of like study to understand filmmaking a lot better. Yeah. And with A Clock of Orange, you see a lot of that in the film. It is difficult to get people into Kubrick because his films are very slow, very meditative, definitely take the time with things. But I kind of like that. I love the precision. I love the there's some kind of perfection going on with every little detail. I really like that. And it makes me envious that I can't achieve that same perfection. Yeah, honestly, I felt mm, less bored watching Clockwork Orange than I did watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What do you think of the designs of uh, Alex and the Droogs? Like, it's a really iconic costume. What do you think of it? I guess I could see if that was the fashion of the time. Maybe you could get into it. I feel like, from what I know about people, fashion probably wouldn't evolve to Alex and the Droogs, the outfits that they were wearing, just because they're emphasizing the part that most people on guys think is hilarious, and they like to make fun of people for that, so I don't know if it would ever become fashionable to do that, but I don't know, uh, who knows? <laughs> From a British culture perspective, it's a very punk look, particularly with the bowler hat, because the bowler hat has often been associated with the upper class British. So there's something primal about turning an icon of the privileged into a symbol for violence. I, I like them. They're, they're, they're simplified, they're, they're, they've got their Britishness to them, um, and they look like, as disturbing it is, they, they look like they're made for what they do. I don't know, man. They look like they, they look like big, they look like they're wearing diapers. They look like diaper dudes and walking around. <laughs> That's probably what they want, though. Like, because they're gonna they're gonna be out there all night. <laughs> <They're> probably... <laughs> Everyone has a different idea of what is cool, and there's lots of people out there who see Alex's Drew persona as cool. I mean, there's a reason why some people like to dress up as Droogs at Halloween. One person silly is another person's badass. They could have just gone all out with like a over the top Mad Max kind of futuristic design for them. But like they kind of like made it a bit more, bit more minimalist, and I, I like that they went that route with them. I do think it's interesting that this is like a uniform or something that they have, because even mm. Alex, I guess when he's not doing anything, he's just hanging out. He doesn't wear that outfit, which is interesting. Mm. I suppose mm. I don't know too much about gangs of roving young men, but at least nowadays, I don't think they wear specific uniforms. So they don't, yeah. But in the 70s, in the 70s and the 80s, it was very much a thing, particularly in British culture. Like, we had we had the mods and the punks and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it kind of fits that. I think that was the costume designer's intentions, or I think I remember them saying yeah. that. I, I got that a little bit, because they do have extra little things that they add to their outfits to make it theirs, so it's not exactly a really stiff uniform. As soon as you see them, you know which gang it is when they come on, come on camera. Okay, here's a question. Were you okay with the NADSAT? The NADSAT is the um, futur futuristic slang that they, they the, the character speak in. It's a combination of Russian Cockney slang and Romanian. Yeah, I thought that was pretty pretty cool. I mean, I didn't I didn't understand all the words and also them having thick British accents didn't help either. We fill it around for a while with other travelers of the night, playing hogs of the road. Then we headed west. 
What we were after now was the old surprise visit. <laughs> I think the first time I watched it, it had subtitles, so that helped. And then I watched a video that was kind of talking about the、um, accent. I watched like a video essay. So the second time I watched it without subtitles, and it was I was okay with it, though I definitely didn't understand everything. I, I was fine with it. I mean, like I when I was a teenager and I went through my Kubrick phase, I tried to read、mm-hmm. A Clockwork Orange, and I spent most of the first chapter <laughs> going back to the index trying to work out what the hell the characters were saying, and I gave up after the chapter. With the film, it's a lot more toned down, and. Whenever, whenever the the characters do speak in that set, they'll often have like some kind of visual、yeah. to help accompany it. I feel like Kubi did a good job of like bringing that language to the cinema. Because the thing is, when he was first given the book, he was like, "I'm not adapting this. <laughs> I've got to <laughs> what it's saying." <laughs> so like, if he could look at that and go like, "Okay, I'm gonna, I can, I can make this accessible to mainstream audiences," I think like, yeah, pretty damn good. Yeah, I think it's really cool they actually went for it too, because there's a lot of future、mm. things where they just talk. The same that we do now, and it's like no. In the future, they would sound different. I think this one was the one that had like the best theme, and they actually stuck to it. Absolutely, it has it has the best theme, best message, and like the film, you can tell the film means it as well. Really believes in it, and like carries、mm-hmm. it all the way through, and consistently reminds the audience this is what our film is about. It knows what it wants to get、yeah. across. It is about the freedom of humanity. And society's relationship with violence, and it ties it ties those like themes, those ideas, really well throughout. The boy has no real choice, has he? Self-interest, the fear of physical pain, drove him to that grotesque act of self-abasement. Its insincerity was clearly to be seen. I like how it makes a point of how much should you punish somebody, because. Mm, I feel、mm. like most stuff from the media that you get here is on the side of like, yeah, you should just keep on punishing people forever, and that's fine. I feel like out of all the films we watched, this is the one that makes you think the most. Even after finishing the film, I'm still like pondering and like thinking, okay, so when when does violence go too far? When does、uh, when does、uh, the powers that be go too far? Those are really interesting themes, and I feel like the the film finds this right line of being like. Unlike natural born killers, which is like、mm-hmm. <laughs> in your face about mess- its message, a Coca Orange is like, okay, this is this is what our characters believe. This is what our characters are going through. It's up to you to kind of work it out from there. Even the ending is a little ambiguous as well. I mean, even if you're not interested in thinking about that, good luck wiping the image of them sliding that those like metal eyelid opening things in. You're never gonna forget that.、Mm, another iconic image. A very iconic image. And they actually put those in there, didn't they? Yes, which brings me on to brings me on to something. Kubrick, as always, and I say this as a Kubrick fanboy who is so obsessed with his work that I've been to a Stanley Kubrick exhibit where they displayed all the original prop, props and costumes. <laughs> like I've been face to face with the Drugs uniform. I'm so disappointed when you said Stanley Kubrick exhibit that it wasn't just like him in like in the zoo. <laughs> 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 no, it wasn't. But yeah, so I'm I'm that much of a fanboy. But I can put that aside and say yes, he was a very talented man. But he was also not a very nice person, and often a very abusive person towards his actors.、Um, and a good example of that would be like Shelley Duvall in The Shining, and in this film, the way he treats、uh, Malcolm McDowell. Because yes, like Viva said, they put the clips in for real, and at one point. The experience was so traumatizing for Malcolm McDowell that, like, he just he just he, he flipped, and he scratched his cornea. There wasn't it wasn't a special effect. He was literally being tortured、yeah. in a chair. A lot of the screaming that comes from Alex in that scene is it's Malcolm, it's Malcolm, and yeah, it might pay off in the film, but when you realize, wow, Malcolm had to like suffer to do that, that's that's awful. And the other example would be, you know, that scene where、uh, the two cops that used to be his drugs like force him into that pig trough、yeah. full of like dirty water. Completely real, and it, all the water was like filled with like some kind of meat a- extract to make it even dirtier, which had like a horrible smell to it. So like, and there's like really long takes of like Malcolm McDowell being shoved into this water for ages and ages and ages and ages, and yeah, he hated doing that scene. I wouldn't blame them. Yeah, and anybody who would say that. It produces better results to do do it for real.、Um, should just watch those scenes because it's obviously like you can see the character crack. You can see the 
performance go away there. The character goes away, and it's not better for it because it's like, oh, shh, what the heck? This isn't good. Okay, so what was the controversy behind this film? When the film was released, much like Natural Born Killers, there were a lot of copycat crimes. There were a lot of people trying to be Alex and the Droogs and like doing really heinous crimes across the UK. And things got so bad that Kubrick and his family got hate mail and threatened his life. So much so that the police said, you need to move. You need to like move and change your names right now because these people are serious. And it was, it got so bad that Kubrick phoned up Warner Brothers and said, pull the movie. And he could do that. He could do that because he, uh, like I said, uh, he was buddy buddy with Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers was like, yes master to everything. <laughs> so like he, he, could, he could literally just say, pull my movie and they could, they would pull it. And he did it to save his family. Bruh, he should have gotten hate mail for torturing his actors. Cause that's what was actually his fault. Do you feel like the movie glorified Alex that much? I don't think it did. I do think it's very clear that Alex is the film's villain and the movie does try to strip him of his egocentric bravado once he becomes a victim of scientific cruelty. It was pretty obvious that he had been directed to give a not heroic seeming performance. You know, like not oh, a macho yeah. performance that people would want to look up to because he, he doesn't seem thought out he doesn't seem like he doesn't have that general movie swagger i just don't see anything mm -hmm. that's cool like the parts of him that they emphasize are the pathetic parts i i think in terms of the direction of the of mcdowell and stuff i think he did a good job of trying at least to portray it in a way that made him seem pathetic i think there are a couple things like if you wanted to be really cautious about it where i question if they should have been in the movie the there don't there doesn't need to be so much gratuitous like nudity in it alex doesn't need mm -hmm. to have uh sex in the beginning he doesn't that doesn't really have anything to do with anything there's just different things like that where it's like you could you could have definitely shot this in a way where people would understand but you didn't need to have it there it does kind of glorify alex a little bit if he's gonna be having sex at the beginning the intent behind that was to impress people with how artistic your movie is because for some reason art people think that boobs are artsy even though they're not and maybe they left it in because they wanted to sell the movie a little bit better of all the films we've watched for this podcast which one would you say shocks you the most it would probably be clockwork orange but only because that was the first one i watched i watched it like a long long time ago when i was mm. a different person um, mm. So I was a lot more easily shocked. I watched it like in my early teen years. So I said that Clock Orange shocked me the most too, but mainly because it's so deeply rooted in my own culture. Uh, unlike the other two films, I can see the Clock Orange story happening exactly where I live. I've been Jambariki. I've been Viva Becker. <laughs> she sounds very uncertain with that. <laughs> <laughs> Is my first name Viva? It's Viva! It's, Viva. it's my last name. Is it Bokka? It's Becky, it's Becky, it's okay, it's okay. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and let us know what is the film that shocked you the most. Cheerio, folks. <laughs>